economy, Nigerians spent $39.56 billion on education, medical tourism, CBN Governor, Cardoso. I am Bola Oba, and this is Plus Politics. The governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Olayemi Kadoso, has said that Nigerians spent $39.56 billion US dollars on education and medical tourism from 2010 to 2020. Mr. Kadoso, in his presentation before the Nigerian lawmakers on Tuesday over the falling Naira, explained the challenges facing the Naira, including the pressure from demand by students studying outside the country. He stated that over 100,000 students are currently studying outside the country, adding that the Nigerian students spent 28.5 billion US dollars outside the country between 2010 and 2020. Mr. Cardoso said Nigerians also spent 11.06 billion US dollars on medical tourism within the same period. Quote, foreign education expenses amounted to a substantial 28.65 US billion dollars as per the CBN's publicly available balance of payment statistics, unquote, he said. CBN, quote, CBN does not have a responsibility to determine who imports or not. For that reason, we want to ensure that we abide by our remit. Plus TV Africa recalled that the Naira depreciated to 1500 Naira per US dollar last Monday before easing to 1,419.86 Kobo this Monday. The exchange rate in Nigeria has increased or depreciated due to the simultaneous occurrence of two factors. A decline in the supply of US dollars coinciding with a surge in the demand for US dollars. Looking at the demand side of the exchange rate, it's important to note the growing number of Nigerian students studying abroad. In 1980s and 1990s, the need for US dollars for their living expenses was minimal. However, recent data shows a significant change. According to UNESCO's Institute of Statistics, the number of Nigerian students abroad increased from less than 15,000 in 1998 to over 71,000 in 2015. By, 20, by 2018, the figure had reached 96,702 students as per the World Bank. Another report projects the number of Nigerian students studying abroad to exceed 100,000 100, by 2022. Additionally, the UK's Higher Education Statistics Agency noted a 64% increase in Nigerians studying in the country, rising from 1320 in 2019-2020 academic session to 21,305 by the 2020-2021 session. Given this data, it is crucial to highlight that between 2020 and 20, 2010 and 2020, foreign education expenses amounted to a substantial $28.65 billion as per the CBN's publicly available balance of payment statistics. Similarly, medical treatment abroad has incurred around $11 billion in costs during the same period. Consequently, over the past decade, foreign exchange demand for education and health care has totaled nearly $40 billion. Joining us are economics analysts Mokhtar Mohamed and Shegun Shokuton. Also joining us is the development and macroeconomic analyst from the UK, 
Festus Tokumbo. Tokumbo, I guess you'll be the most appropriate person to start with. Uh, Thank you, Bob. The central bank governor is subtly, without criminalizing you people, subtly letting Nigerians know that with the kind of horde of young Nigerians going abroad to study and their fees paid by their parents and guardians in Nigeria, that leakage is a big whammy on any economy. And like a banker will tell somebody whose balances are not okay, I can only tell you that this is your balance. You cannot fault me for running your account low. How would you respond to the remark of the central bank governor? Hey, thank you for having, having me on your show. First thank of you. all, what I have to say is that Mr. Cardoso's analysis is a layman's analyst of the, the fundamental cause of currency crisis in Nigeria. About a month ago, I published an article titled Nigeria may become poorer by un unwisely following IMF and World Bank policies. That article was published in written four hours in the, by a university in the US. Basically, there are four fundamental parts of the current crisis in Nigeria. There's the IMF, there's the World Bank, there's the corrupt government and weak institutions. I mean, if you analyze the government that we have since we, we are, went to the uh, government in 1999, till date, the PDP, well, if you do the institutional analysis, we are these people are more better than the APC. During the federal government, when Barry was sworn in, in 2015, the SN was 198 to 1 US dollar. When it was living in 2022, it was 422 to 1 US dollar. I'm not a fan of Emifili, but in my opinion, Emifili has the best methodology of managing the currency crisis in the Nigerian uh, money, uh, currency monetary policies. Emil Philly, for eight years, he was at longer age with the IMF Award Bank for refusing to completely adopt a market-led exchange rate. The government will freeze the rate and allocate currencies for essential goods and services that are very crucial to stabilize the price level. When, and despite the multiple exchange rate, despite the oil subsidy fraud and the oil theft, the Nigerian currency was still relatively stabilized compared to what we are today. When President Bright became president last year, the exchange rate was 422 officially to the US dollar. Today, when at the, at the, at the, at the black market, it was simply traded at 655. Today, it is about 1,500 naira. It's the reason for that is by is for adopting a market led monetary rate. And oh, okay, let, let me let you made your point. Uh, let me uh, go to Mukhtar Mohammed now. Mukhtar Mohammed, um, in a way, Yemi Cardoso is like your banker or my banker. If my account is not uh, looking pretty, it behoves me. It's incumbent on me to find a way of changing either my lifestyle or my, produ my productive capacity or indeed my expenses. It is not the fault of my banker that my account is running lean. That should be that should be something that I should look inward at myself, uh, review my strategies of, of existence and revenue profile to attend to. How would you respond to the remark of the central bank governor in respect of not only uh, foreign education expenses and indeed medical tourism? Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I think um, we are we are seeing a government that is stylishly blaming, doing the blame game on um, on Nigerians because they decide to school abroad. Um, it's not a policy that was introduced today. We are not the only country that have done those policies. This is the same government. Some time ago, one of the ministers, I can't remember, said that um, 
Jagba is part of um, development. Uh, if you go abroad and you go to school, it's part of development. And I want to say, before the advent of COVID, Nigeria remittance in the diaspora was even higher than what we made in terms of profit from crude oil. They also play a role in stabilizing the exchange rate for a very long time. So I think uh, we are just, um, yeah, like um, yeah, yeah, the guy in London said, he's just um, talking um, common economics rather than dealing with the fundamental issues that are that's, um, um, affecting the Nigerian economy. I've said it that Niemi Kadusu is a policy man and um, he's trying to use policy to stabilize the Naira. You cannot stabilize the Naira with policy. You must stabilize the Naira with monetary policy, not administrative policy, by saying, oh, you will not give FS. Like he said, they've done this thing. It's not up to six months. The rate, I mean, they, they exchange it has hit 1,500. And we don't know where to go tomorrow. So for me, I think um, they took some decisions without looking at the consequences. They are good decisions. I, I, I totally agree with market determine exchange rate so that I can drive investment into your sector, into your economy. But again, for you to be market developed exchange rate, you must have the liquidity. And what I mean by liquidity, no central bank in the world allows currency to float without intervention. Now, what we have seen is that we, we decide to float the currency, we didn't have the liquidity. You don't leave your currency for market forces because market forces are there to make, to make gain. They are there for profits. So they will definitely batter your naira, especially uh, your currency, especially if you don't have the, the liquidity to intervene. There's no part in the war, no CBA in the war that allows its currency to just go unhindered. There must be an intervention. In China, sometimes, when they realize that the goods and services is higher than that in the U.S., they devalue their currency to make their goods and services cheaper for other world. And when China devalue their currency, America begin to shiver because that means their goods will come down. So those CBI is meant to create market uh, um, stability. And here you are, you have a government that is, like he said, we are import-driven. Majority of what we take, we import it. And this is a government that came and met a rate of, of exchange for imports of goods at 400 and, um, 419 naira, and have moved it to 1,410. And you say you want the economy to strive. How will it strive? And also the cost of goods has gone up. Meanwhile, okay. you are moving the productive tariff in the productive sector that brings that create jobs. You are moving their tariff by 1,000 to 1,410. Uh, and then the consumption in terms of budget, you are putting it at 800, 800 naira. So what are you trying to do? Why are you not putting the import duty tariff at 800 and then then take your consumption to 1,410 so that it will reduce your amount that you want to consume. Then you begin to look at, like you said, means of balancing. We don't have this to say. But I think, um, unfortunately, um, we, have a, a, we, are, we, we, have, we have an issue in our hands that the way they are going, if something is not done soon, okay. we may uh, be high. Let, let, me go, let me go to uh, a fellow economist like you, Mr. Sheldon Shopiton. Mr. Shopiton, one would ordinarily have thought that the people on whom this humongous amount of money were spent in the quoted decade are also the people who power the 20 billion US dollars plus annual remittances to Nigeria. An amount that conveniently competes with the average annual budget of Nigeria. So, something is telling me that if they are good policy strategists, they should be looking at amassing the inherent forex generating ability of these people by either improving on the rule of law improving on the economic opportunities that those people can invest in in Nigeria beyond the remittances they send to sustain family members. So, maybe if Mr. Yamika Doso had thought deeply enough, he would have known that the money spent on education in the last 10 years on Nigerians in the diaspora, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, is actually one of the invisible sources of strength for the for the economy. Maybe that is why the economy has not literally collapsed. I'm just thinking aloud. 
How would you want to? How would you want to respond to his remark? I mean, you're you you are absolutely spot on. Um, it's um, extremely disingenuous for the governor of the central bank to say something with all due respect and apology to him and whoever might be offended. It's something as pedestrian as that, you know. Um, you you do not look at uh, your currency management, your foreign exchange rate management uh, um, uh, framework and begin to blame individual and independent segments uh, of your entire trade uh, activities. You know, and that's what this, this uh, uh, foreign currency, uh, school fees, medical expenses, that's what they are. They are just a segment of your overall trade activities. You know, so you now say, oh, it's because some people are going to school. That's why there's so much pressure on exchange rates. Excuse me. That, that's not good enough. That, that's, that's not, it's, um, it's, it, it's, it should be below the, the level of thought that one would expect from somebody that is holding an office as high as Mr. Cardoso is holding, uh, an office as sensitive as Mr. Cardoso is holding. The reality is that your population, you know, you have a 200 million population, my goodness. These 200 million people will do all sorts of things. It's like when they say, you know, that a man that has many children, there is no way you will not find one thief, one blind man, uh, maybe a crazy person, because there are so many. You know, so if you have a population of 220 million, you are absolutely and inevitably going to have a segment of that population that will simply desire to explore their personal capacity and potential. Especially when you don't have a coherent human capital development strategy that will, that, will, that will annex and develop exactly. the humongous population within your borders. Exactly. So if you have a situation where your educational sector is, you know, cannot compete, let, let's be honest with ourselves. In the 80s, people from abroad, you know, a lot of us that went to university in those days, you know, we had classmates from Ghana, we even had classmates from, you know, white, white, white-skinned people coming to Nigeria to come and school. And then you had white-skinned people lecturing and teaching in Nigeria. You know, it's now the other way around. Now Nigerians are going because those things have deteriorated. Our medical um, services are completely uh, uh, debaculous. You know, so people have to go to Ghana and South Africa to get health care rather than stay in Nigeria. So Mr. Kaduso is not talking about our structural problems, our infrastructure problems. He's blaming citizens for simply doing what ordinary human beings will do, which is to look out for their own interests. What Mr. Cardoso is supposed to, and there's something you said that I think is absolutely critical. Um, our diaspora community are uh, an investment. You know, there is seed that Nigerians have sown. We've thrown these seeds into the world, and because they are still rooted back home, they have fathers, they have mothers. Mr. Tokumbo is there. I'm sure majority of his family is still in Nigeria. He's still deeply rooted in Nigeria. He will still have economic activities that he can do in Nigeria. What Mr. Cardoso and, you know, other policymakers in the federal government should be doing at this time is to see how they can actually move our average $20 billion diaspora remittances per annum from $20 billion to maybe 40 to use policy instruments, to use regulatory instruments, to use investment instruments to attract funding beyond subsistence funding from this community to look for how we can create funds for diaspora. You know, if you look at India, India was very deliberate in harnessing the funds that these diasporans can send home. They have the diaspora, um, uh, they call it the NIR, uh, uh, um, diaspora, I've forgotten the name of the account. They have a special account type that is specifically targeted at Indians living abroad because they recognize that they have a huge community of Indians across the world. So that's what Mr. Cardoso and his colleagues are supposed to be doing. Look at this community. How can we get them to send more money home into sectors of the economy, target their funding, target their spend, you know, to ensure that we are deliberately harnessing these guys to develop our economy. And then the other thing to say is, invariably, the value of your currency will be determined by two things. There are two um, tripods, not three now, two. One will be your balance of trade issues, or do I export enough, do I import enough, and all of that. The other will be policy. You can, by, by, by monetary policy instruments, by fiscal policy instruments, be very deliberate in attracting liquidity 
into your market, foreign direct investment, foreign portfolio investment, and um, grants, loans, all of these things have very little to do with exports, with trade. Our policy framework is such that it discourages inflow, free inflow and free outflow of, of, of foreign exchange, which is one of the reasons why we're having this scarcity now. The other point, there is something about the um, domestic, uh, the, the DCA, um, uh, this NNPC practice where they are allocating um, a specific domestic crude allocation, a specific proportion of our crude production is allocated for consumption locally and is paid for in Naira. This policy started about eight, ten years ago and has consistently has an adverse effect on our forex earnings from crude. This is one of the major problems that we're also having. All of these things, Mr. Caduso is not talking about them. He's talking about diasporans oh, okay. who are just uh, in let, trying let, to live let, their let life. Let me go. It's, it's not good enough. Let me go to Tokumbo. Tokumbo, as a development and macroeconomic analyst, um, you, I, I, I would rather want to hear you uh, take a panoramic view at the policy table of this government from the trade policy to monetary policy or basically the global picture of how they really, because there does not seem to me and I don't pretend to be you know to be experts like you guys to be an expert like you guys now, nah, but there does not seem to be policy coordination. There does not seem to be policy coherence. Uh, people uh, typical of Nigerian administrations, uh, you know, it's not peculiar to this administration. It was the same. Emefiele was at some point becoming the de facto, the de facto uh, minister of finance, governor of the central bank. Uh, almost chief of staff to the president, uh, minister of economic planning, and I, I, I can see this administration, maybe it's me, Tokumbo, I can see this administration almost reenacting the same tragic, comedic, you know, policy melodrama. How would you want to respond to that? As I have rightly said, I mean, the failures of President Buhari and the President Tinubu is macroeconomic failures. Government, uh, it is important that both fiscal policies and uh, uh, monetary policy are aligned to create a sustainable development. If you analyze our fiscal policies, most of our, our borrowing, government borrows to sustain the economy, to, rock, to, to finance the budget. But it's essential, it's very important that you engage in sustainable borrowing. Let me give you an example. During the uh, government of Buhari, we had two main sources of funding, of loans. We had the Chinese loan regime, we had the American loan regime, which is basically the IMF and the World Bank. While the Chinese loans were invested, basically, were used to build the, the seaports, the seaports in Lagos, the train transport that connected the major regions in Nigeria, and the airport. Those are sustainable loans. Look, at the longer run run, they will contribute to the internal knowledge generated revenue. As a matter of fact, the, the transport, I mean, the travel commuter to GDP has, in, has increased because of the train system. But when you examine the IMF loan, in the past eight years, they were being used to finance subsidy. They are, they are bad loans. They, they were not, the IMF will not give loans to, inv to invest on infrastructure development. That means to internal generated revenue. They won't do that. And when you consider the monetary policy, as I said earlier on, a market led exchange is not sustainable for Nigeria. Let's examine Nigeria, for example. If we examine Nigeria's GDP, the highest sectors is the services sectors. In those sectors, we have the banking, we have the telecommunication. Let's examine telecommunication. The biggest actors in that department is NTN. And the study actually shows that NTN makes about $10 million every day by Nigeria that are purchasing, uh, to, 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 purchasing airtime for their, for their mobile. So 
what I'm trying to say is that to stabilize the macroeconomies, to I mean to drive to drive development in Nigeria, governments have to be actively involved. We need to promote policies that improve local production of goods and services. And that depends on electricity. The 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 bill that President Mo signed to law this year, the electricity is a very fantastic bill that will improve our energy sector in the next five years. But before then, the government needs to promote policies that maneuver the macro, I mean the monetary, the market, the money, the monetary, the monetary, I mean the monetary aspect of the economy. The market led economy is not sustainable. My colleagues talk about the remittance. Nigeria is the, is the highest, seventh, the seventh highest remitting countries in the world. 34% of remittance to South Africa go to Nigeria. But this remittance does not contribute to our liquidity. Do you know why? Because most of the actors there, the fintech, they are fintech, they are foreign companies. In the UK, we have Lengthy, we have, um, we have, uh, we have uh, PESA, PESA is a Canada company. When I send money from here to Nigeria, PESA is my money. I pay in error. They pay you in error there. This fintech company, we take this for art currency to manipulate our currency market because the government has give license to fintech companies. So this, those limited don't go to our, according to our liquidity. So that's why government, Nigeria government must be involved in managing the economy. You cannot leave everything for the market. You cannot market the damage your exchange rate, interest rate, and exchange rate. That will destroy the social economic variables. And that's what is happening in Nigeria at the moment. So, uh, I'll come back to you, Tokumba, but to be honest with you, when you keep saying they cannot leave everything to the market, they cannot leave everything to the market, are you suggesting, uh, are you suggesting a controlled economy? Uh, are what you, I'm suggesting uh, is a controlled monetary policy, SCRA basically, because the SCRA redetermines the price levels. A MFLA method is a fantastic method. A MFLA said it went to the U.S., he said Nigeria is spending about 30% of his army to import fuel. He said when the Dangote's factory is fully operational, that will support that will help our liquidity. That's what he said. We can't allow the market to determine our fair prices. It's not possible. We need to, we need, we need to track the currency and allocate, allocate forests to essential goods and services that will stabilize the price level, that the fair prices. You can't allow the market actor to do that. And the main, cause, the main reason of doing that is because of attracting international I mean, investment. And since they adopted this policy, how many billions are they adopted? How many billions are they brought to the country? Is there like 15 oh, billion dollars okay. they have been there? Let, let, me go to your, let me go to your colleague, Mukhtar Mohamed. Mukhtar. Uh, we now have to be speaking to ideas to help if we don't see any form of policy discipline or policy articulation that is tidy and is like every uh, principal officer of the government especially in the area of the economy if indeed i was shocked when the Minister of Finance and the Coordinating Minister of the Economy had the temerity to say that the economy was in a better place uh, when, he, when he mouthed it relative to when they came to power on the 29th, when the president, <laughs> and I was thinking, is this gentleman living in Nigeria or we just quickly borrowed him from uh, Ulala land, you know? But what are some of the ideas that uh, somebody like you would like to put on the table? Uh, at least let's put ideas out there. We never know who amongst them may, may get to watch these. And let's see whether uh, things can be, can be turned around for the better. Mukhtar. Okay, thank you. Uh, for me, I think we should look at, a, excuse me, we should look at an homegrown economy policy. Um, the era whereby we do this copy and paste method where the hike rate in America, we hike rate, they bring down rate, we try to bring down rate. I think we can look at how we can own our economy. We could see that happening in the equity market. You see Nigerians running that space now about 90%, 95% of what you see happening in the equity market is run by Nigerians. And we've not had those kind of... Um, um, running out of the economy like they would normally have if we have crisis. So 
I think we should look at being, being a homegrown economy policy. Now, the world has become a global village, so you cannot isolate yourself like China did isolate themselves. We should begin to look at tax as a way to grow our economy. We shouldn't just be looking at tax as a means to get revenue. I've said it over and over. What we've seen is in the government is that when they look at tax, all they think is how much can we make? They're not looking at tax to say how much can this uh, company bring into our economy? How much? There are many numbers of Nigerians with this company be able to employ? Uh, Mukta, we are not looking Mukta, at, we are just looking at the revenue. Mukta, I I'll come back to yes. you on this, but given that point you just made, we have a political culture where anybody who unfortunately to Nigerians but who is fortunate to be given a political position just believes that it could send a toffee or a thug out there uh, and shake people down. So our tax mentality is I am in government. I don't care if the economy is strangulated just go get anything from anybody whether that person is on an okada is in a car is he has a shop he has anything that is so what is so much as that point of revenue generation is not a church or a mosque just go and shut them down that is our tax that is our fiscal mentality i wonder any economy that could grow under that kind of mentality. I'm just thinking aloud. Yeah, I agree with you. Even the, 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 the presidential committee chairman for tax said that we should use area voice at a point. Even if he came out to deny that he didn't say that. At the point he was saying, why can't we use area voice to collect taxes? But later he said that's not what he meant, but definitely he has sent the message. And if you stay in Lagos, you realize that there's multiple taxation everywhere and there are the towns that they use. It's not only Lagos, everywhere in Nigeria. All this political. Okay. I have no so, crime in this country. For, for me, I think we have not looked at that space. Then one key driver of the Nigerian economy is the informal sector. How have we been inclusive in that sector? How have government been able to help that sector grow? Why are you thinking of um, a hiking rate to attract foreign investors so that they will buy your treasury bill and others? And then you have a local industry that provide jobs to over 70 to 80 percent of Nigeria, rather than help them grow, you are starving them of cash, you have come with cashless policy, they cannot receive cash. And, and you know the businesses. irony, uh, on that very point again that you've just made, you know the irony, a, an aspirant, Bola Ahmed Tinumbu, a candidate, Bola Ahmed Tinumbu, was actually saying that it would make it a matter of policy for interest rate to come down so that the drivers of the economy, like those people that you specifically mentioned, the micro, small, medium entrepreneurs will be able to access capital to inject into their business. But uh, I guess uh, you, know, you, campaign, that you campaign in poetry and you, you govern in... No, there's a saying that says talk is cheap. Anyone can talk. And I think... What we have seen in this government, they keep talking, like you talk about the coordinate the coordinating minister saying that we are we are we are on the right path. And I ask myself that we have attracted about eight hundred million dollars in terms of investment. And then I looked at the exchange rate at when you came in. What is eight hundred million dollars now to, to, to stabilize the exchange rate? And you look at when you came in, what was the price of goods and services? You are a government, you came in. You just think of increment. The three sectors of government, I mean, the judicial, I mean, the, 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 the three arms of government, the executive, the, um, the, 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 the states, and also the local government, have received more allocations since we came in. The last time we had, where they have about 3.3 trillion. And yet, the people are hungry. You came up that you were going to release the reserve of bag of rice. That was December, before Christmas. We never saw anything. You come up, you just say what the people want, and then you don't add it up. I say it, and I say it categorically. Yemi Kadoso is a policy man. He's a, he, after, Christ, uh, after Charles Suludu, he's the second policy man that we're having in the M of CBN. He comes with policy. He deals with policy. He believes in policy. Policy can bring stability in the short term. 
but monetary policies, not administrative policy. Monetary policy is what will sustain your economy in the long run. You can come up with, don't give Nigerian diaspora FX again to go to school. Nigeria here must compulsory school here. That will not bring down your exchange rate. That will complicate the issues. What you need to do is come up with microeconomic policy that will definitely attract investors into your economy. What we are seeing now is a government that it seems to lack idea. They seem to say what they want to do, but they don't seem to be doing okay, it. I'm let, sorry. Let, let, me go to your let me go to your colleague, uh, Mr. Shokuto. Mr. Shokuto, we are where we are now. The picture is a bit... Uh, the picture is a bit disturbing looking at the economy as it is, but we cannot just be uh, blame trading. We, it's imperative too that we put ideas on the table uh, so that generations after will say uh, at least some people traded on, on, on ideas. How would you want to go about it? So um, talking solutions, uh, Mr. Goldlob, I think that, and I know that these guys listen to this program, so, you know, that's gratifying. So we need to, we actually do need to do exactly what you're saying. We need to suggest solutions to our government so that, you know, if they succeed, it's, it's the success of Nigeria. Um, the first thing that we must tell our government is they have to look inwards, they've got to become ingenious, they have to be deliberately um, local in their thinking. This idea of pandering to the Bretton Woods institution must stop. They are digging us into a deeper grave by going after the policies of the IMF and the World Bank, policies that they, those, the countries that fund those institutions do not follow those policies. They don't randomly and discriminately, indiscriminately remove subsidies. They don't randomly and indiscriminately devalue their currencies. They do those things in a targeted fashion to achieve um, overriding medium, long-term um, development objectives. So our government, the first thing that I will say is think local, think what's best for Nigeria, forget about IMF, forget about World Bank. Now, going to specifics, there are some basic fundamental things that government needs to think about. Look, let's forget all these high valuting ideas, uh, monetary policy, fiscal policy. If you fix power today, Power, just the problem of power alone. You will see the impact that this will have on development and economic growth. It's going to be an explosive um, geometric progressional improvement in everything. Uh, so but somebody, I am uh, not seeing uh, the focus. Uh, Mr. Shokuto, somebody, yes. who, uh, who's, somebody who is a supporter of this government may want to tell you, ah, but after all, the first, uh, the first bill that uh, President Bola Ahmed Tinumbu signed into law was the decentralization of, of power and that that ordinarily should be an enablement for uh, private uh, investors, uh, communities and states to so, solve yeah. their own power, power problems. Look, it's one thing to enact a law. It's another thing to implement it. What we are saying is that they need to drive the process of solving the fundamental just problems like, of this country. Just like we have just so just like we have just like we have had just like we have had hello just like we have had licenses on refinery given to to dozens of the, of so called exactly. uh, investors for Our more than a decade. And uh, except Why except Go on, go on. Sorry about that. Exactly. Exactly. You know, so 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 that that it's not enough to just um, say, oh, we, we've enacted a law, therefore we've solved the problem. No, you've not solved the problem. You've enacted the law. Now you need to develop a, an implementation strategy, an implementation program with timelines and milestones that will tell us that we are in day one now, by day sixty, by day one eighty, by day three sixty five. This is where we will be. And then go about implementing this in a methodical manner. That's on power. On the informal sector. Hello, hello, Mr. before you leave power, when the president uh, 
when the president announced that subsidy was gone, he days after rolled out some very fantastic policies on the gasification of of our power and for some of us investors indeed some of us we send personnel to as far as Italy to go and learn how to convert generators and, automot and automobiles to use CNG as we speak that policy seems to be in somebody's file on somebody's table and nothing tangible is moving regarding that policy. And yet, yeah. uh, and yet, we are still buying diesel to produce I mean, look, basic, basic things. We're still buying yeah. diesel at one, almost 1,300 to run, uh, to run uh, you know, uh, heavy duty power generators. Sorry. It's yeah. very, it's, it's very unfortunate, you know. So talking about um, uh, compressed natural natural gas and other forms or sources of energy for our equipment, for our vehicles, and all that, um, it's one thing to just um, say these things in theory. As far back as three years ago, I did a study on conversion, and I realized that this is something that is going to take many years to achieve conversion of an economy of an entire country from one source of energy to another is not something that happens in six months it can't happen in two years the, just the sheer investment that is required the sheer volume and scale of implementation project implementation that is required you are talking of deploying gas dispensing um, um, uh, machines across filling stations all over nigeria that will take time. It's not going to happen overnight. You are talking about conversion plants. You are talking about the cost of conversion. These things will not happen overnight. You know, so when I heard that as an alternative under the fuel subsidy removal bin, I just laughed because I've done a study on this before and I know that it's not cheap. The, the car, the average small sedan, as at the time that I did this study about two and a half, three years ago, would cost 300,000 naira to convert to CNG. How many Nigerians in today's you are so, economy? You are, you are so right. Naira. You are so right that as of today, at today's exchange rate, because it's an industry where I'm so involved. Um, one of the directors of a company, especially that focuses on human capital development in that in that sphere, so as of today, to bring in an average kit, an average kit for a sedan. A sedan automobile, you are now looking at today's exchange rate, you are looking at about 1.1 to 1.2 million naira. I mean, just, just, just imagine that. I mean, absolutely crazy to think that that is the solution to our problem. So, I and yet, and yet, if and yet, even if you brought it in and you have the competent technician to do the installation, exactly. that's the conversion. Yeah. You don't even know in a city as big as Ibadan, there is only one refueling point by the express So, so if somebody lives in Bodija, you would have to drive to to the toll gate to go and refuel. Or if you are in Lagos, there are just about three or four points in Lagos. Yeah. So, so, so you have to deploy, you know, um, gas dispensing machines, uh, you know, just like your normal. Uh, petrol pumps across the entire country. You are talking of 36. Then just imagine the size of Nigeria, 926,000 square kilometers. You know and how what that will take. So it's it's clear that people did not think through these policies very well before they just went to town and implemented because the IMF was saying implement. So that's what I'm saying. Stop this IMF and the um, World Bank romance. Come back home. Look at China. Look at India. Look at Korea. Look at the Asian tigers. Malaysia, Indonesia. None of these countries follow the IMF model. None. Zero. They all looked inwards, went about things the way that they thought would work for them. India is oh, now oh, the okay. third largest uh, economy in the world. Uh, Mr. They do not follow IMF. Mr. Shokuro, let, let, me, let me give your colleagues the opportunity to wrap up in 30-30 uh, seconds each. Uh, uh, Tokumbo, 
Okay. How would you want to wrap it up? I don't want to. I don't want to talk by example. No. Before Mila, uh, Mila was appointed as finance minister in Nigeria. She has worked in for twenty years. When she came to Nigeria, she went to China to initiate currency swap. That is the dollarization. Some of the fundamental solutions to our problems is to the dollarize. We need to initiate currency swap with China, India, some of our top trading top trading partners. Government also need to promote policies that improve local production of goods and services that will cut down our importations. And for the main time, we need to peg the currency. Governments have to decide the estimate. We can't leave it at the mercy of the market. That will destabilize our social economy. Okay, directly. let me go to let me go to Mukhtar Muhammad. Mukhtar, how do you close this? Well, I don't agree that government should find the peg the exchange rate. It has not helped us. It has depleted our reserve. We have made uh, some people in the street more so much billionaires over just going to CBI and collecting three hundred million every week. I still believe that we will know the true value of our currency. Let's try to get that liquidity to make sure that that value of our currency is maintained in the market where CBN can definitely intervene. For me, that is the key. We don't need to do what we're doing before. It's insane to keep doing what you are doing before and think you will get a different result. That's for me. Then secondly, I think the government should look at the informal sector. Look at this informal sector. There is a gold mine there. If government is able to unlock that gold mine, definitely the economy will be power constrained. Uh Mr. Shokotan, how do you want to close it? Well, I mean, look, government should become creative. We should forget IMF, World Bank, and just look at what are the things that we need to do that will drive our own development, our own way, based on the peculiar problems we have. We need to put our thinking caps on, and that's my encouragement to our government today. Think. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, we really have to uh, wrap it up at this juncture. Uh, thank you. We will do. I always appreciate when you come on. Uh, we look forward to having you all over again on some uh, very interesting economic issues. Thank you. Thank you.